Welcome in to Husker Hangover. I'm Brandon Shanahan, joined as always. Now we got uh, the Nugget Cam set up here. He's a sleepy little guy, but he'll be along the ride here. He's, he's usually sleeping in that chair, but we figured we'd give him some spotlight here today in a very exciting episode. As always, we're live on Twitter every Sunday, as well as uh, on YouTube and Spotify and wherever you find your podcast on Monday mornings. So it should be uh, exciting stuff. Plenty of ways to find the Cornhusker Connection Network. Like, subscribe, all that fun stuff. It helps us out a lot. Even if you don't like it, just pretend like you do. YouTube doesn't know the difference. Just tell us that you like it and be nice. Uh, great week. Holy smokes. To kind of get into some of the fun stuff. Uh, obviously, Huskers big win over Purdue. Uh Tell you what, uh, I'm as excited as I've been in years as a Husker fan. It's uh, this feels like we're turning a corner. Obviously, that the ceiling still isn't very high. Saw what happened when we played a team like Michigan. We get that. It is what it is. But that's the formula. That is the formula where it's not going to be pretty. But you, you force enough turnovers, get enough opportunities. Take advantage of certain aspects. Henry Carberg, not very good, but it is what it is. But overall, a 31 to 14 win against the conference team, even as, you know, not great like Purdue. Well, I don't even want to qualify that because let's not forget, Nebraska would lose to Purdue regularly. I mean, this isn't, uh, this isn't nothing here. 34, uh, 31 14 win. Over Purdue, uh, Henrik Harburg, six of 11, 122 yards, two touchdowns, no picks. He did have a couple of fumbles, maybe just the one, but definitely uh, not a, a great day. The Husker defense holding Hudson Cardo, 100 passing yards, one touchdown, two picks. Emmett Johnson leading the way with 76 yards on the ground. And then Jalen Lloyd. The leading receiver was 73 yards. Grants is just the one, you know, the one big reception that, that does it. But this is the formula, man. And I talk about it whenever I preach Heinrich Harburg is this is why you go with a quarterback like that, as opposed to the higher ceiling guy like Jeff Sims. It's you just you don't need great, you don't need special, you don't need even like good at this point. You just need secure. And now, granted, definitions of, of secure, subjective here because Heinrich Harburg hasn't been great at holding on to the football the last couple of weeks. So there's still that. It's not a slant. It's not as easy as this guy doesn't turn the ball over. This guy does turn the ball over. This guy does turn the ball over. But this guy, that's all he does. And I, I guess I'll jump into that. Um, I've been pretty adamant about wanting Jeff Sims to be back. You know, the brightest timeline is Jeff Sims plays and Jeff Sims is good. I think that's pretty clear. However, I, I'm good with not seeing him again this season. I mean, you get, you get one play where it's not just receive the ball handed off. You get one play and you fumble, it turns into a, Scoop and score now. Now we got to send the starters back out there and lock this game in. You kidding me? You can't go one play without fumbling. And that's kind of what, what where I'm at with, with Jeff Sims. Is yes, I know he's more talented than Iron Rick Harbor. I think he was a better recruit. I guess he made a lot of plays at Georgia. We're not going to win any football games because of our offense. It is what it is. But my God, we are opening ourselves up to losing football games if Jeff Sims has to come in for an extended period of time. And I get, you know, he was fine at Georgia Tech. He made a lot of plays, this and that. I have not seen anything from Jeff Sims as a Husker that would indicate that he's nothing more or nothing less than a turnover machine and a absolute liability. I mean, let's not get it twisted here. Liability. That's the nicest way to put it. It's all he's done. And it timing matters. Yeah, Heinrich Harburg fumbled this series before. I'm willing to give him a pass. I have a feeling when we get our co-host on here 
maybe they won't maybe they won't see it as much of a pass as, as I will. But he did just get cracked in the chin the play before. So I'll give him a pass for that. But you also got to look at timing-wise. Like the Minnesota game, inside the five-yard line, he throws a pick. And then game-winning drive, throws another pick. Those are the two picks that he plays. They're driving against Colorado. He throws a pick. He fumbles a couple of times. You know, to there's right before the half, and there's a little bit of time where you're throwing the ball. And he looks so rattled and so uncomfortable that he throws another pick. He comes in for one play where he doesn't just hand the ball off. Then he fumbles. Can't even hold on to it then. Um, so, yeah, I'm I'm good. Um, I'm good. I'm good on Jeff Sims. Don't need it. Um, man, what a disappointment, though, if he really doesn't turn out well. Um, because I wonder... I wonder who else wanted him out of the transfer portal. I wonder if I can see that on 24 seven. Cause he was, it seemed like he was pretty, pretty well touted out of the transfer portal. Let me take a look here. Let me pull that up. Cause I wonder if it shows it. Because I would have loved to see like the other teams that were, that we're fighting for him. So that's 2024. Let's see here. So we forgot how many like good transfers we got. Billy Kemp was a transfer from Virginia. Eric Gilbert turned out to be a disaster. Ben Scott came in from Arizona State. Jeff Sims, quarterback from Georgia Tech. Timeline. That's not what I'm looking for. Let's see. As a prospect, he was a three-star prospect. This and that. Yeah, I guess I don't see. Yeah, I don't see any other teams in on him. But, you know, I'm good on them for, for knowing better. But I, I get it. You want to make a move. On a, on a quarterback, you want to build your your quarterback room, especially in a sense where you're losing Casey Thompson, you're losing Richard Torres. You, you don't feel good about anybody else in there. Logan Smothers is, is he's not starting; he's probably gone. Um, but like I said, otherwise, great win for Nebraska. Um, great win for Nebraska. So I'm I'm pretty juiced there. Kind of getting into some of the other college football. Scores going on. Oklahoma, what a disaster. Yeah, you really got to think that I was really expecting them to at least come out and be a little bit more buttoned up than they were the previous week coming off of bye. I was kind of hoping that they were just rusty. Not the case. Um, not the case. Um, USC stinks. You have a 49 points to California. And I, I've been high on Cal. Like I, I think Cal is a very sneaky good team. Definitely not a team that you want to see on the road, I guess. But forty nine points is crazy. Um, I'll also say this while I'm on the the topic of of USC. I I don't get, I don't get the the slack that Caleb Williams has been getting in the media here. Because first of all, there there's this crazy notion which I know isn't reasonable, but that notion of Oh, he should just sit out the rest of the year. He's going to go to the NFL. He's got more to lose than he has to gain. That's not what football is about, man. And I guess if you're his agent, you're probably thinking that. If you're his business manager, you're probably thinking that. But if you're a football fan, football analyst, a football anything, that can't be your your date. Why would you want that? Why are you encouraging that? I mean, that is such, such irresponsible. I don't know, man. Maybe you're trying to to farm clicks, I guess, but that is just, you can't like football and then encourage that at the same time. It's just not, not redeemable. And 
I, I think there's also this narrative for Caleb Williams that he's cocky and arrogant. And yeah, there's probably some of that. Like the the thing with the, the fingernails in Utah last last year is not nothing. Um, but what I see more than that is I see a competitor. I see somebody who loves to win. And I see somebody who hates to lose, which is exactly what I would want in my quarterback. Um, I mean, I guess kind of want like an even kill guy, but fuck dude, when the game's on the line and you need somebody to will your team down, that's the guy that you want. That's the guy that you want when nothing else is, nothing else matters other than winning that football game. And I guess it's a, it's a bad, it's a bad look. You know, you see the haters online posting pictures of him crying after that Utah loss. I mean, but that to me is such a plus. It's like this dude is going through it and feeling the consequences of a November of an October loss to Utah. We're not talking he just lost the national championship in heartbreaking fashion. He lost a game to Utah. You can see how much he wanted to win that game. And I just think that that's such a, a redeeming quality in a football player and a quarterback and a leader that I think the rest of the media is getting wildly wrong and they're wildly irresponsible in that realm. But yeah, you also uh, can't lose to Cal. So shout out to him for pulling that off because he needed to pull it off, which is crazy to think about. Florida State cruised. Penn State didn't look great against Indiana. Maybe Penn State's not very good. I was really high on them this season. But that was mostly because of Drew Aller. I figured he was going to come in and elevate this team because they got a great defense. They got great pieces around them. Their offensive line's good enough. But yeah, 20 for 31, 210 yards. At home against Indiana's not great. Iowa State blew out Baylor. We'll talk a lot about that on Go Big 12 or Go Home with Drew Russell. We'll have that coming out this week. Uh, Louisville shut out Duke. When I talk about Duke, I, I don't talk. Now, granted, without Riley Leonard, it's a little bit tough. But no, they did have Riley Leonard. No, never mind. That's Don't listen to me. That's just the uh, the season stats. Like, wait a minute, he threw the ball ninety five times. No, that's not true. That's that's not true. Let's see here. Yeah, he did play nine for twenty three, one hundred twenty one yards. Yeah, he stinks. He stinks. Um, he's coasting off of that Clemson game for sure. But and now, granted, he's hurt and this and that. But uh, when I talk about Duke, you obviously don't talk about talent. You obviously don't talk about pedigree. But you you um you talk about experience. They're one of the most experienced teams in the country. And to get shut out, that's a big deal. Louisville, watch out. Seven and one. They've been playing outstanding football. Jeff Brom, man, maybe Purdue was really holding him back. They did lose that stinker to Pittsburgh. What the, that's gonna bite them in the I mean that knocks them out of, out of the college football playoff race, which is crazy. Cause you don't think that you're gonna be going into November thinking, man, if we had just won with this one game, we'd be right in the playoff thick of it but bad loss got got him out but that's not nothing um let's see here we'll talk about ucla and colorado here the nuggets are great the abs are great how about the broncos the broncos won they're outstanding so let's just kind of jump into um better worse same here I, the segment we do every week, we talk about who's better than I thought, who's worse than I thought, and who is um, the same as I thought. So let's see here. We don't need to do that. Ba, 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 ba. All right. So who's better than I thought, who's worse than I thought, and who is the same as I thought? Um, better than I thought, the Big 12. Also, worse than I thought. Um, the Big 12... I think is such a great conference for college football because I because you have the SEC where Georgia's miles better than the second best team. You have Michigan, Ohio State, who were miles better than the third team. But then you have the Big Twelve where you can get beat by anybody on any day, and that's beautiful. That's the chaos that college football brings because every game like that matters. 
You know, you don't get that in the NFL where, yeah, the, the Chiefs lost to the Broncos today. And it doesn't actually matter. It matters for me as a Broncos fan. I, the vibes are hype. But realistically, in the playoff race, it's one out of 17 games. And all they have to do is be better than the Las Vegas Raiders and the Los Angeles Chargers. And then they're going to make the playoffs and then do it, do what they do. So it doesn't matter. Um, also worth mentioning, like, this is the ninth conference game. Like, this is where that comes into play. When you talk about teams in the SEC who have gotten this crazy pass and this crazy bias for um, getting two teams into the playoff and excusing this and excusing that, they, they only play eight conference games. This is why that matters. Because in the Big 12, you have to play that ninth conference game. In the Pac-12, you have to play that ninth conference game. Like, that's crazy. That's a big deal. That's not nothing. And nobody talks about it. So it's it, it's huge. And that's why I think it, it's better. Now, Oklahoma did lose that game. They did lose bad. In the second week in a row, they looked bad. So they're a little bit worse than I thought. Um, and now we have a five-way tie at the top of the Big 12. <laughs> How great is that? I can't believe it. Iowa State's in there, too. I mean, they win against Kansas at home. They're favored. That'll be fun. That'll be fun. Um, better than I thought, we kind of hit on it now. Louisville, 7-1. and one. Year one under Jeff Brom. And, I mean, we've seen folks win there. Bobby, uh, not Bobby Petrino. Brian Kelly won. No, he was at Cincinnati. Oh, man, trying to think of who was just there. Who was the coach under with Lamar Jackson? I feel like they had a really good football coach. Got to look this up here. But like I said, seven and one under year one of a new coach. That's always very impressive to me. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, that's very impressive. Let me look here. I wonder if this takes me there. Probably not. Whatever. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Um, Louisville is a good fo football program. They're playing great. Oregon, man, if they had beaten Washington, I would probably make it a case that they should be the number one team in the country. They look so good, and he looks so dialed in in a way that you want out of a top one or two team. Like, obviously, Georgia and Michigan are boat racing everybody they play now because they're the best teams. But Oregon's doing the same thing. And I'll tell you what, if, if they don't have that loss against Washington, yeah, I'm putting them number one in my in my set of rankings here, as you'll see on the Cornhusker Connection show here coming up this week. We have two episodes out every week here on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts from. You can find Corners for Connection. So you'll find those rankings here later this week. But and we kind of talked about it last week. It's like take discount resume, discount the game with Washington. Who's a better football team? Which, you, which by the way, you can't do. The games have to matter. But when you do that exercise, you probably come to the conclusion that, yeah, Oregon's probably a better team. They won it in dominating fashion again. Washington stumbled again, you know, barely beat Stanford. Oregon might be better. And I'll tell you what, I, I, if I have one hope in college football this season, it's probably that Washington and Oregon went out so we can see another, that game again on a neutral site on a Friday night. Pac-12 championship game winner goes to the fucking college football playoff. Are you kidding me? That's what college football is about. That's what conference championship football should be about, by the way. And that's why it's probably it's it, it's for the best that you get rid of divisions in this 12-team conference, but you get matchups like that, and they're just incredible. Let's see here. Who's worse than I thought? Jeff Sims. Yeah, like I said, I'm good. I'm good. I've seen enough out of him. Um, and I... Heinrich Harburg has turned the football over quite a bit over the last couple of weeks. You can't discount that. 
That's definitely not nothing. He's definitely got to clean that up. But it just, and th- this feels like a shitty football take, but it just feels different. Jeff Sims has turned the ball over inside the five yard line with an interception. He turned it over on a potential gang winning drive in Minnesota. He turned it over a couple of times in Colorado, real bad ones when we were driving to when we needed to respond right before the halftime break. And then Colorado blew the game open from there. And then you get one play where it's not just a handoff to the running back. And it's still, you still can't hang on to the football. I get it. Heinrich Harburg's turned the ball over quite a bit over the last couple of weeks, but it just feels different. When he turns it over, it's, it feels less consequential. It feels like it's at moments where you, you don't go into that drive thinking, we need, we need something out of you. You know, the, the fumble against Purdue, by the way, after you got cracked in the chin. So that's not nothing. Um, he gets cracked in the chin, and then, yeah, he fumbles it when Nebraska's up three touchdowns. You, you look at um, last week, I threw an interception on the first two passes. Yeah, that stinks. But then he bounced back pretty well, didn't turn the ball over after that. And he, and he's made some really big passes. When he's throwing the football down the field, his wide receivers are getting open, he's finding them. And that's not nothing. Now, granted, it's the intermediate stuff where he's got to get it over the offensive line, which he can't seem to do. Um, so that's a problem. But uh, nonetheless, big there. Uh, also worse than I thought, Jordan Travis's Heisman campaign. Uh, I think Jordan Travis is phenomenal. He's had such a great season, but he has no chance of winning the Heisman Trophy. And Joel Klatt alluded to this in his show, so I don't want to take all the all the poise here. But he's so here. Here's the deal: he's completing sixty five percent of his passes. He's got his team undefeated on a very clear path to the college football playoff. At 2,100 yards, over 260 a game, 18 touchdowns, and two interceptions. He's good. He's really good at football. But, and Joel Cloud put it this way, he doesn't have any big stages. And in this year's college football class, and this high has been contending group, there's a lot of players who are going to have some really big stages that Florida State's just not going to be on before voting comes in. You have J.J. McCarthy in Michigan. He's going to play against Penn State, which will be a pretty big game against a five-star quarterback in Drew Aller. And then he's going to play in Ohio State. I don't, or He plays at Ohio State, which is going to be the biggest game of the college football season. Once again, 15 million people are going to watch. That's as big of a stage as you can get. And even out West, Michael Penix Jr. is going to have a likely showdown in the Pac-12 championship game. Bo Nix is going to I hopefully be right there with him in that Pac-12 championship game. Um, you look at Dylan Gabriel. You know He might have another opportunity to, to flex on Texas in the Big 12 championship game. He's going to have an opportunity even Saturday to to eliminate o- Oklahoma State from a Big 12 title race. Jordan Travis might be the best quarterback in college football, but he just it, he, he just doesn't have the opportunity to show that on a on as big of a stage as those guys do, and that's what it's going to come down to because it seems like he either win the Heisman because your stats are just abnormal, or you win you have Heisman moments. Like I'm thinking Johnny Manziel. He he was never a crazy stat guy, but he had some big moments. Um, Trying to think, Devontae Smith, he was kind of that guy where it's just like, he's that much better than the second best wide receiver. Uh, he's outstanding last year. Caleb Williams, kind of the same thing. And he had some pretty, no, he didn't have any big moments last year. But, I mean, outstanding stuff. Um, and I love Jordan Travis, but his numbers just aren't there to where it's it, it's a blowout in that fashion. Um, I think I finally have a good beat on Colorado. And I think it's uh, pretty similar to what my initial take on them would be at the beginning of the season. And that they're going to be insanely, uncomprehensibly 
improved compared to last year. And I don't think that there's a case in America that there's another team who can claim the most improved, whatever. That's such a big deal. Going from the worst team in college football to four or five wins. That is a crazy mark. And really changing the temperature of that program, which has been so stale the last couple of years. For a school who traditionally hasn't invested in football in a way that they probably should have been. Um, but yeah, you have that go on, and that's uh, such a huge deal. However, you're still not like a Pac-12 championship contender. However, you're still not going to make a bowl game. Both of those things can be true. Is that You can be miles and miles improved and be the most improved team in the country, and do all these great things for the program and the university, and still not be very good. And that's where Colorado is. Mississippi State, another win for me. They got uh, their blows thrown off by Auburn. Um, I did miss last week. They did beat Arkansas, and I had that written down as a loss. But that's the only game so far that I've missed through September and October. Um, so I've so far been right about Mississippi State. We got a couple of uh, touch and go games here. I'll kind of determine how uh, how valid that is. So we'll, we'll see how that goes. Uh, then I'm also right, as always, about the SEC. The, and, you know, I, I kind of mentioned on earlier, they play eight conference games, and that's a big reason why that they have had the success that they have. Not because they don't produce great talents and that they're not great football programs, but the, the, the gap between them and everybody else is a, in large part because they play an eighth conference game. And the way that these teams manipulate the, the schedules, like, Alabama always gets a bye before LSU, and they always get a cupcake game before Auburn. That's crazy that you can manipulate your schedule like that when teams in the Pac-12 can't do that. No, no, no. Teams in the Big 12 can't do that. No, no, no. Teams in the Big 10 can't do that. No, no, no. Teams in the ACC do that, but that is what it is. Um, I guess the same kind of goes for them, but they don't get the same kind of cachet um, as yet uh, SEC does, so. That is what, what what it is. So that's my better, worse, same here. We'll wrap it up. We'll make it a pretty quick episode here today, but it uh, should be a great week for the Corners for Connection Network as far as um, what we get going on. A big win for Nebraska over the weekend. Another opportunity for them to, to get another win and an opportunity to get bowl eligible for the first time since 2016. The f- break the longest streak in uh, Power 5 football as far as not making a bowl game. An embarrassing statistic for Nebraska football with the opportunity to be wiped clean and off our shoulders with a win on the road in East Lansing. So that should be outstanding stuff uh, from myself. And we got Nugget the Cat in the corner from us here in Dallas, Texas. Thank you for watching. Like, subscribe. Like I said, just comment something nice. You don't even have to believe it. Just something nice. Go Big Red.